record it. So now, since we learned all that, we're gonna, I'm gonna test you on it a little bit. All right, uh, does anyone wanna volunteer and just read the first question? Next up. I'm good. I got it later. I don't wanna fill it all. Yeah. Sorry about that, Matt, that was a lot. I apologize for making that sentence so long. Um, all right, so what do you guys wanna do? What do you think, uh, how should we manage this patient's hypoxia? Who thinks we should intubate the patient? No? Who thinks we should start with something else? All right, yeah, let's start with something else. So this, uh, I'm just gonna try to kinda go through the way I think about um, management of patient's hypoxia and also hypercapnia, really just any respiratory decompensation. So the first thing you wanna do anytime you see a patient is just do your ABCs, right? Um, is the patient apneic? Is the patient failure to actually protect their airway? Um, one of the major things that you're first gonna look at for if they're failing to protect their airway is like, can they talk? If they're talking and they're talking to you and then they seem like they're fine, they're protecting their airway, so that's good. Um, if they're not, you really want to do a, a good examination. Um, you definitely kind of want to do the head tilt um, thrust and kind of see if there's secretions being pulled in their mouth. Check their neck, see if they have, you know, listen to their neck, see if they have any strider. Um, the biggest thing you don't want to do is a gag reflex. So that's something that's like a big no-no. 20% of people don't have a gag reflex anyway, and then you can make them vomit. So just don't do that. But the first thing you just want to look at, are they apneic? Are they failing to protect their airway? And if they aren't, you do the bag valve mask, uh, kind of what we just went over. And then you kind of do that until you have to intubate the patient, especially if this is something not reversible. If they're apneic and you think maybe they're apneic because they got a little bit too much opioids, you can probably try a little bit of Narcan, but just always have intubation in your back pocket. All right, next. So now, so we're just kind of gonna go through the hypoxia. What do you want to, so this patient's hypoxic, what, what kind of things would you consider putting this patient on? You really can't go wrong. All right, you high flow. So just remember the thing from you guys' perspective is the nurse is gonna be calling you and the nurse is not gonna be able to put someone on high flow. So when you kind of get this call, you, you need a respiratory therapist for that and it's gonna take time for the respiratory therapist usually to get there. Unless it's an RT, then they're already there. So high flow, definitely something you can do. Uh, what other kind of things are you thinking of that the nurse can do? Yeah, so low flow nasal cannula or, or a mask, right? Um, you can definitely put this patient on like a non-rebreather. If someone's that hypoxic, I think the non-rebreather, just like Kevin was saying, is probably like the easiest thing to go to. Just put them on a non-rebreather, get their sats up, and then think about going to something else. The nurses can do it. It's all right there. Um, so this is kind of what the nurses can do. They can do low flow nasal cannula. They can also humidify it and go up to 15, but really if you're doing that, respiratory therapy should know about the patient because they might need more advanced stuff. Um, they can do the simple face mask, partial rebreather, um, and also the non-rebreather. Someone's really hypoxic, I say you just put them on the non-rebreather first um, and see what happens. The venturi mask is really the only thing I think we use it for is like hypoxia in a COPD patient when you really wanna keep their um, oxygen status in a narrow range, COPD you always want them 88 to 92 or else they get worsening VQ mismatch and actually worsening hypercapnia. Um, so venturi mask can be very helpful. It does something called jet mixing. Um, which basically keeps their FiO2 at the same rate at all times, no matter how fast they're breathing. All right, so you put this patient on um, a non-rebreather and then respiratory gets there. Uh, and then the things that respiratory said, you know, they can do high flow nasal cannula. Um, and what else can they do? You guys know? But yeah, BiPAP and CPAP, right? So those are things definitely to consider, um, especially for patients, so for hypoxic respiratory failure, uh, especially with patients with um, heart failure, uh, positive pressure can be really, really helpful. The kind of the theory behind it is that it actually uh, pushes that alveolar edema. Um, the positive pressure actually pushes that out of the alveoli and back, back into the vasculature. 
and these patients will respond much quicker with positive pressure. All right. If any of these fail at any time, you intubate, right? So it's always your plan B. Always think about that in your back pocket, especially if something's not working and you've tried most of the therapy. All right. Um, what are some contraindications to CPAP and BiPAP? Maybe I'll just give me like two or three. What's that? Yeah, vomit, right? It's like if they're going to vomit into their mask. Um, you know, don't put them, really don't put them on, on any sort of like face mask, right? That's pretty dangerous. Uh, they can vomit, they can aspirate that. Also, if they can't take it off, right? If you think you're going to put a, this on, like someone can't take it off, that's a major, major issue. So really like altered mental status, failure to pick their airway. Um, you're kind of already up here anyway. Um, other just random ones are any uh, upper GI surgery because um, some of that air can go in the esophagus and go in the stomach. So if they just had surgery there, that can be a contraindication as well. Um, those are, I think, the major ones. All right. I won't go over this kind of we just went over. So I'll just kind of skip the slide, but I'll provide it in the PowerPoint just for if you want to look back at it. All right. So the patient's hypoxic. We put them on an armored breather. Looks good. Respiratory therapy puts one on uh, BiPAP. Um, the patient's doing well. Uh, so really, anytime you approach one of these patients, stabilize before you try to diagnose, right? Try to make sure that they're, you know, they're, you're probably going to be doing both at the same time anyway, but stabilization is always more important than getting to the underlying cause in a, an acute situation. So this patient, like, you want to you get their oxygen up before you start really thinking about why their oxygen is low. This patient's oxygen's up, they're, they're on BiPAP, they've improved. So what kind of tests can you guys think of just to work up shortness of breath? Stuff that you can do on the floor, things that you can do quickly. ABG, yeah, always an ABG, any single time. Um, the difference in ABG and VBG, uh, so ABGs are helpful because they can tell your oxygen status. VBGs can't do that. Um, the other thing is ABGs are much more accurate on your CO2, and the higher the patient's CO2 is, the less accurate a VBG is. So VBG is actually... Um, pretty sensitive for hypercapnia. So if you have a VBG that has a CO2 that's normal, you're pretty sure that the patient's not, not hypercapnic, but if someone is hypercapnic, it doesn't really tell you the level of hypercapnia that much. Um, the pH and the CO2 are just both a little bit more acidotic than an ABG. Um, so that's just things to remember, ABG versus VBG. In this situation, the patient's hypoxic, you should probably go with an ABG if you can. All right, anything else? What's up now? So, there, I mean, no matter what, the ABG is kind of just going to be like a snapshot of time. I think you should probably try to stabilize them before you get the ABG. Um, so, yeah, if you got it while they're super hypoxic, the ABG is going to reflect that. But if you got them after they kind of already stabilize them, it's going to reflect that. So, it's just a snap, snapshot in time. Yeah. All right. Anything else, maybe specifically for this patient? Yeah. And then something to consider. Now, I, I don't think you have to start with a rule out of PE on the floor, but, you know, I think a lot of your – Unless you're really, really, unless you're obviously really clinically concerned about it. Um, but yeah, but you can always start with kind of the easier stuff, the stuff that doesn't have really any risk to it at all. So that being an ABG, someone said a chest x-ray, never be scared to order a chest x-ray. If you guys ever think about ordering a chest x-ray, just order it. Um, so ABG, chest x-ray. What if this patient was already also having like chest pain? Yeah, and I think you should just get an EKG on every patient. So ABG, chest x-ray, EKG. Um, and then you're probably going to get full labs on these patients. I mean, if someone is, you know, acidotic, you're going to want to see, like, do they have an elevated lactate? Um, a CBC is helpful as well. Um, anemia, major cause of, like, symptomatic anemia is called the shortness of breath. So this is what I call the pyramid of dyspnea. I didn't make this up. Uh, I had to change it, change it around a little bit. I think it was someone, Jay Zier made this up. No, Jay got it from someone that lectured him at his medical school. It's not. I don't think that. All right. Uh, so really just thinking about shortness of breath, you're going to be shortness of breath for really two reasons, right? To fix your, ox fix your um, acid base balance or to get oxygen to your cells. So what kind of acid base disturbances will cause shortness of breath? Do you guys know? So say a patient overdosed on aspirin. 
so like a respiratory alkalosis, or if they're compensating for this one. Yeah, metabolic acidosis, exactly. So those are basically gonna be the two reasons. Um, I always think that someone's showing his breath, kind of if they're having that, like you should, you know, basically, and they think they're septic, it's kind of like the poor man's lactate. Um, you know, if they're showing his breath, it's because they're acidotic and they're trying to actually breathe off all that CO2 to compensate. So that's a big one. So metabolic acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. There's other causes as well of respiratory um, alkalosis other than just aspirin. I think the two biggest ones is pregnancy. Um, you're trying to, you know, in pregnancy, you're really trying to um, create a favorable pH gradient for CO2 to be uh, brought from like the baby to the mother so she can blow it off. Um, but there's also another clinical syndrome that kind of replicates um, pregnancy with really, really high estrogen levels. Um, and that's in patients with liver cirrhosis as well. So a lot of times liver cirrhotics from those high estrogen levels will have a respiratory alkalosis too. And you kind of always have to consider that when you're putting one of them on a vent. All right, so what other causes, we went through one of them, um, would give you cellular hypoxia. So I think the first one would just say is anemia. Um, but there's other causes of cellular hypoxia that can cause shortness of breath. So let's say I have a patient who has just uh, had some smoke inhalation um, and they come to the ED and they're a little bit altered, a uh, little bit confused, what kind of things would you be thinking of? Yeah, carbon dioxide poisoning. So that's a, that's a big one. Um, how about a patient who's on like Dapsone prophylaxis um, and the patient comes to the ED and they have hypoxia, they're at 85%, you put them on a bunch of oxygen and like they're not improving at all, they may be like a little bit blue. Methemoglobinemia, exactly. So. Those are the ones you really want to think of. Um, the other one is cyanide. And the interesting thing about cyanide is actually there's really no test to diagnose cyanide. There's like a send out, but you won't get it for days. Um, so you really just have to do it on clinical status. Um, the thing that can be helpful is a lactate. So an elevated lactate in someone who just had smoke inhalation uh, above 10 is pretty sensitive and specific for cyanide poisoning. Oh, damn it. What, well, so what, kind, what do you need to do to diagnose this? If you saw it, don't say. Yeah, okay. Everyone probably saw it. Uh, so a coox, right? So coox symmetry. So that's how you're gonna diagnose these. I didn't really know that intern year, so I thought that was kind of helpful. All right, so next thing, you know, for um, hypoxia, you're gonna need your heart to be pumping blood to the rest of your body. So, you know, the two major things you first think of is someone with an arrhythmia or an MI. Um, what kind of things would you want to, you know, just send on all these patients just to make sure they don't have one of these? Yeah, EKG. So EKG is kind of part of every single time you're going to work up these patients. Um, and also, you know, with troponin, I think troponin and a pro BMP can be helpful as well. All right, what if I have a patient who uh, comes to the hospital, history of malignancy, um, the patient's short of breath, uh, they're dachypnic, very elevated JVD, you go to listen to their heart and you can't really hear any good heart sounds. What kind of things would you be thinking of? Yeah, PE, all right, so definitely always on the differential. Um, uh, and that can absolutely present exactly like this. Um, what else? And then say you got that EKG and the EKG shows electrical alternates. Yeah, there you go, Grant's got it. Yeah, so EKG can be helpful for tamponade, um, but you know, it's not always, uh, not always completely diagnostic. Um, but you will show kind of low voltage um, as well as electrical alternates. How about a patient, young lady, 30 years old, who's had dipsy, like dyspnea for the past two months, um, very loud P2 on exam. You see some clubbing as well. What kind of things would you think of? Loud P2. Yeah, pulmonary hypertension. Yeah, exactly. And how do you want to work that up? Or anyone, Ben or anyone else? Yeah, like how would you kind of, like what's your first test when you think someone may have pulmonary hypertension to help diagnose it? Yeah, an echocardiogram. So this is gonna be um, helpful for really all of these three things right here, is, you know, doing a TTA plus minus a bubble study. Um, when you're thinking of pulmonary hypertension, you do want a bubble study because a, um, a right to left shunt is, a, you know, actually sorry, left to right shunt is a cause of pulmonary hypertension. Um, yeah, but absolutely for sure. And then the TT, what's up bro? Okay, yeah, yeah. So a bubble study is they actually inject bubbles into the venous side. 
uh, and then you actually do an echocardiogram and you look at those where those bubbles travel. And if you see bubbles going from your um, right atrium into your left atrium, that can be uh, concerning that the patient has something like an a like a large ASD or like a PFL. Um, Tell us about the timing, bro. <laughs> Oh, you're thinking of hepatopulmonary? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So hepatopulmonary syndrome is another one um, where if you do a bubble study, and I think, what is it, five beats? If it's after five beats, then you're yeah. concerned for hepatopulmonary syndrome. So that's like intrapulmonary shunting from uh, basically um, dilated pulmonary vasculature. So that's another thing that can be helpful too, especially if they have a patient with cirrhosis. Um, the way to diagnose pulmonary hypertension from an echo is actually looking at um, every patient will have a tiny bit of a tricuspid jet. You measure the velocity of that jet and, that, and then you use an equation basically to see what your right atrial, sorry, right RV pressure is. All right, the next ones I'm just gonna go through is the last one, biggest category here is gonna be your lung. So I kind of put this into three things, things that cause alveolar filling, uh, which can be water, either cardiogenic, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, blood, pus, or spit, right? Next thing is causing compression, so atelectasis. Um, which can either be compressive atelectasis, so um, basically having pressure going this way and then like something like a, um, a fusion or a pneumothorax causing compression of the alveoli, or absorptive atelectasis, which is like something like a mucus plug. Uh, the next one we're going to think of is ILD, um, and then what, is, and it, what can you do to really diagnose this? What are you going to see? kind of all three of these things. Maybe not as much ILD. What would you use to diagnose one of these? Yeah, just, just your basic chest x-ray, absolutely. The other thing that would be really helpful is lung ultrasound, looking at B-lines to see if they have any pulmonary edema or interstitial lung disease. Um, looking over here, over here as well, to see if the patient has uh, any like pleural effusions. Um, and also even looking for um, whether they have uh, a pneumothorax can be really helpful too. Uh, the next one is going to be, you know, vasculature. Uh, so, you know, really on here is going to be PA. Chest x-ray is going to be negative, and that's really going to increase your su suspicion for a PA any, anytime you have someone with shortness of breath. And the last two um, I think of is like bronchi. Um, so this could kind of be including asthma, COPD, bronchiectasis, anaphylaxis, uh, as well as things that can actually cause um, shortness of breath um, basically either from extra parenchymal compression, so someone has nasty scoliosis, or a lot of times, and a couple of times I've seen the hospital, like diaphragmatic weakness too. Um, and this should just kind of work up with uh, spirometry and physical exam. All right, so you kind of, kind of guys showed me the tests. So the patient comes back with uh, basically this um, ABG. So does anyone want to just tell me um, what they think is going on with the patient? Kind of what kind of respiratory failure is going on? I'll give you guys a minute because it takes a little bit to look at an ABG. So is it hypercapnic or hypoxic? Yeah, so hypo this patient's got hypoxic respiratory failure. And you kind of send off some labs, so you send off, you know, the uh, CBC. Patient doesn't have anemia, so that's kind of exited out. Um, you send off an EKG for the patient, uh, and the EKG kind of shows sinus tachycardia. You don't have any ST changes. Troponin is negative. The patient's pro BMP comes back at 2,000. Um, and then you also kind of send off an X-ray. And here is your X-ray. Does anyone want to read this? Or we can do the Allen Gandler method. Um, so is this x-ray uh, unilateral, bilateral? Bilateral, right? Um, all right, is it uh, focal or diffuse? Okay, and then do you think this is interstitial? You think this is alveolar? What do you think? What's that? Yeah, alveolar right there's like kind of fluffy infiltrates. Um, and then what's another thing that you may be able to do bedside? to check if it, like for short, to work up shortness of breath. Say if you're in the unit and you have one of these. Yeah, ultrasound. 
All right. Does anybody, why is this? Hold on a second. Damn it. What's that? I don't know. Doesn't pick it up? Like Google Drive, you mean? All right. Yeah, I could probably do on Google Slides. It's mine. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. Should have checked. Uh, yeah. All right. What do you guys think this is? Oral fusion. So you're looking here. Let me just tell you exactly where you're looking. You're looking right here. So you're looking right here. You kind of put your ultrasound probe down. Um, so you can kind of see the pleural line here. The pleural line's moving back and forth. So that makes the, makes you realize there's not a pneumothorax. Well, what are these things that are coming down here? Does anyone know? B lines, yeah. So what the what does that tell you? Yeah, so there's probably fluid in the institution. So they're very, very sensitive for you know heart failure, but they're not specific, right? Um, so if someone has ILD interstitial thickening from that, um, you can get B lines as well. And it doesn't matter exactly what type of edema. So if it's cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic, like ARDS, all these are going to show B lines. Um, just kind of going off what B lines are. Um, so if anyone remembers like a beeline from a chest x-ray, that's exactly what a beeline from an ultrasound is. Basically you have, um, increased left atrial pressure. That left atrial pressure that's increased is actually, um, basically goes all the way back to the interstitium and the secondary pulmonary lobule and the, the venous drainage of the secondary pulmonary lobule becomes engorged. Um, and when that venous drainage becomes engorged, uh, right here, and you look on an ultrasound, you're gonna see B lines. When the patient breathes, those B lines are kind of good to go back and forth. Um, so that's kind of what can be helpful. Uh, ultrasound for B lines is actually more sensitive and specific than a chest X-ray for heart failure. Um, so like the likelihood ratio is like 10 and the negative likelihood ratio is 0.1. Uh, on a chest X-ray, it's only gonna pick up 70% of heart failure. About 30% of heart failure can be, be chest X-ray negative. Um, basically because they get lymphatic hypertrophy and they drain a lot of the fluid back that way. All right, so yeah, this patient, what do you think this patient has? So they got an elevated pro BMP, they got B lines, they have acute onset. Sean, what do you think? Yeah, this patient's got some heart failure. So how do you want to treat this patient? Yeah, diuresis and they're pretty hypertensive. They're like 198 over 108. Do you guys want to start anything for that? Yeah, so, you know, uh, so hydralazine could be helpful, but really in this, um, no, it's all right, because okay. I'm going to go back to the, yeah, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint a little bit. Um, sorry, thanks, bro. So really, uh, in this patient, I mean, you know, hypertension greater than 185 or 110, and the patient has heart failure, it's kind of a hypertensive emergency. Um, and so when you have someone that has heart failure, um, and they're very, very hypertensive, you can use uh, IV nitrates. Um, so like IV nitroglycerin is gonna be really, really helpful. It's gonna be titratable, it's gonna be quick acting. Um, patients can get better much very, very quickly. And the reason why you use nitroglycerin is that it decreases your preload. So it's gonna decrease pulmonary congestion pretty quickly. You don't always, you have to, you know, you shouldn't always obviously use um, IV nitroprusside on anyone having heart failure because they can actually get low blood pressure. But if they're hypertensive and have heart failure, especially in this case, Definitely IV nitroglycerin. No, sorry, IV nitroglycerin. All right, uh, next patient. So I'll, I'll kind of read this one out. Um, patient is a 76 year old male, has passed hypertension, uh, passed, presents to the hospital with dyspnea for the past 2.5 months. 
Um, he also notes kind of in the, for the past couple, and these are all real cases too. He also notes that he's been having some trouble walking. Uh, it's been going on for like months now. Um, vital is patients a febrile, to get back to 30, tachy to 110. Um, normal blood pressure, but the patient's oxygen is 87%. Um, the nurse puts him on some uh, like, you know, low flow nasal cannula, goes up to 96, patient looks okay. To the exam, you kind of note that he's breathing pretty quickly, no JVD, normal heart and breath sounds. But his neuro exam does show some weakness in the left leg that's been kind of going on for a while now. So what, um, what kind of tests do you guys want to do for this patient? What's the three tests that we kind of most patients should get when, they, when they're having kind of respiratory failure? Yeah, so we get a chest x-ray. We also get an ABJ, perfect. So chest x-ray shows this. Does this look like a good chest x-ray? And why not? Well, it's yeah, it's underinflated. Yeah, so just kind of going through. I always did peer, but um, you know, position and then inspiratory. So, why do you think there is underinflated or like a poor inspiratory effort? What makes you think that from the chest X-ray? Uh, I only count. You know, I don't count. Yeah. So we try to get the chest x-ray, we ask him to breathe in, but he's, you know, he's having a hard time doing that. Um, you get an ABG, which is right here. Uh, so what do you guys think about this ABG? What kind of respiratory failure is the patient in? Yeah, respiratory acidosis, so hypercapnic respiratory failure. We get the, um, we get the CBC back, the patient's had anemic. Um, we also get an EKG for this patient, the patient's fine, and we kind of went through the chest X-ray. So we kind of covered most of our, you know, basis. Um, so how does that change your differential that you think the patient looks like they're hypercapnic? Um, what kind of things here can lead to like hypercapnic respiratory failure or hypercarbic? Yeah, COPD. So things that really mess with your airways, right? Um, a lot of times these patients aren't going to be able to fully expire. They're going to have low tidal volumes. Um, so they're going to have a buildup of CO2. Uh, what else here is going to give you um, hypercapnic respiratory failure? Yeah, so the extra parenchymal, like diaphragmatic, right? All these are going to be decreasing, low in your tidal volume as well. Um, which makes it difficult to really blow off CO2. So just to kind of go through this real quick, um, just oxygenation versus, so hypoxic respiratory failure by, versus hypercapnic respiratory failure. So oxygen, the way I think about oxygenation kind of depends on diffusion as well as perfusion. So the uh, equation for oxygen diffusion is area over thickness, um, basically thickness of the membrane that you have to diffuse oxygen through, times PaO2, so alveolar O2, minus um, your arterial O2. So what's some ways that you can increase your PaO2? What's some things that you can maybe do on like a ventilator to increase this? I heard increase the PEEP. So increase the PEEP and increase the uh, FI, increase the FiO2. Yeah, exactly. So those are the two major things. Um, increase this, the PEEP just gonna increase that pressure um, throughout the respiratory cycle. One of the other things that I didn't know until residency that it's gonna increase your PaO2 is actually your respiratory rate. Um, so when your respiratory rate is actually faster, what happens is that you're in inspiration more than you're in expiration and you have more pressure during inspiration. So your pressure, um, the amount of pressure in your alveoli over time is actually going to be increased, which increases your PaO2. Perfect. So the things that mess up the area are things that cause alveolar filling as well as things that maybe cause compression, right? So compression um, like a pleural effusion or absorptive atelectasis. Um, all right, so just some cases. The patient, a uh, young guy comes in with pancreatitis, um, and then you see this chest x-ray. Um, and the patient, you know, is really severe pancreatitis, been getting worse over three days, and then develops sudden hypoxia in this. What do you think might be going on? Yeah, ARDS. So when you're thinking of things that cause alveolar filling, think of fluid. So heart failure, ARDS, think of um, 
think of blood, think of pus, and think of spit. So those are the major things. Spit being like aspiration, always should be on your differential. All right, how about this patient? The uh, older guy just got out of the unit. Um, you know, he's been on the floor, having some trouble clearing his secretions, and you get caught on night flow, and the patient has acute onset uh, hypoxia. What would you be thinking of? Yeah, mucus plug. All right. And um, so the one of the things that you're always going to look at on any, any times you see this white out of the lung, I think Alan Gandler went over this, is any times you think it's absorptive atelectasis, so like a plug somewhere that's going to create negative pressure, the trachea is actually going to deviate towards it. Um, and then any time that you think it's like a pleural effusion or um, like pneumothorax, it's, the trachea will be going the other way. So yeah, this is absorptive atelectasis, which is usually mucus plug, foreign body, something like that. Um, causing like a plugging of your airways. All right. So next thing you want to think about is things that cause uh, thickness of the alveoli. So really ILD. So this is a patient, let's say a 30 year old lady um, comes into the hospital, actually comes to your outpatient cl clinic with chronic dyspnea. She has these little nodules on her shin maybe a little bit of arthritis, and you get this chest x-ray. What are you guys thinking of? Yeah, sarcoid, and what is this here? Yeah, it's, yeah, lymphadenopathy. The differential diagnosis on like, basically things that kind of look like this, these um, basically like, like hyaluradenopathy, could also be um, pulmonary hypertension with pulmonary arterial engorgement, but it's gonna be a lot more cleaner looking. So it's not gonna be as like fluffy, but that can cause um, like a similar presentation. And how about a patient who comes in with a hip fracture um, and then the patient, uh, you know, gets to the hospital, they're dyspneic, they have some um, basically uh, non-blanchable uh, rash on their legs, what would you be concerned of? Yeah, fat embolism. So any embolism. I put a, just a pretty much a normal chest X-ray here because that's really going to increase your s suspicion of some sort of embolic phenomenon um, anytime you have a patient who's short of breath with a clear chest X-ray. So it's always really helpful. All right, and then just kind of going through your differential of hypercarbic or uh, respiratory failure. So the first one is basically patients who won't breathe. Um, so what kind of meds do you worry about on the floor that can give you um, hypercaptic respiratory failure? Yeah, opioids, and then what else? Yeah, opioids and benzos. Those are ma the major two that you're kind of thinking of. Opioids much more than benzos. This is hard to write with. All right. <laughs> uh, next one you kind of think about is the things that affect the bronchi. Um, so you're thinking of uh, COPD, you're thinking of asthma. Um, rarely, you know, bronchiectasis can give you hypercapnic respiratory failure. And then you're thinking of extraparenchymal causes too as well. So things that cause diaphragmatic weakness, um, which the differential is pretty broad for. You know, it's anything that really interferes with muscle contraction. Um, so that can be uh, things that just interfere with the action potential of the muscle. So even electrolyte abnormalities. The big one you're gonna think about on the floor, and I've seen this once as a patient with hypophosphatemia, uh, can actually get diaphragmatic weakness from that, low ATP, so they're not, you know, they don't breathe. Um, and then you're gonna think about myopathies. Um, you're gonna think about neuropathies like Guillain-Barre, and even things that affect your like neuromuscular junction as well. Um, so what are some causes like neuromuscular junction uh, that can lead to dyspnea and diaphragmatic weakness? Yeah, myosinic gravis. Um, yeah, exactly, kind of going the same thing. And then like poisoning, like organophosphate poisoning, or uh, what's the other one? Botulinum as well. So there's definitely some things to think about. It should always kind of be on differential for hypercaptic respiratory failure. All right, so this patient, um, you know, is hypercapnic. You know, we kind of have that. We already kind of ruled out these causes, right? You can't fully rule out uh, ILD with a chest X-ray. It's not completely sensitive. You have that typical uh, board exam question where, you know, the patient has a clear chest X-ray and you think they have ILD, you always need a CT scan, um, but it makes it less likely. And we don't really have a, comp you know, too much of a compatible history here. Um, we kind of rolled out most of these calls with EKG, anemia. So using, um, just you can kind of base your differential diagnosis off the ABG as well. 
So it's the, the fact that this patient has hypercapnic respiratory failure um, makes it pretty unlikely it's going to be vascular, right? A, a PE that's extremely severe that a patient needs to go on a ventilator for um, can actually cause hypercapnia um, basically by increasing uh, dead space ventil ventilation. But really, when you see a patient that has a PE and they're presenting to the ED and they're not intubated, they're usually actually going to have a little bit of respiratory alkalosis. So that's kind of ruled out. Um, usually this will be high, you know, hypoxic respiratory failure as well. Um, and the patient actually is, um, and then usually this actually won't really have any abnormalities on the ABG. So it's kind of these two. This is what we're thinking about. So for this patient, um, I was lucky enough that, you know, I was bedside and this patient actually had most of these things worked up outpatient for about the last three months and all of it was negative. So, God damn it. one second. So anyway, um, you know, I was kind of concerned that maybe this patient had somewhat like a diaphragmatic weakness. Um, so this is the patient trying to breathe into one of those uh, parameters. So that was really all he could do was just like 50 cc's. That's like the only thing he could breathe. Um, so, you know, there's other ways to do this on the floor. So anytime you think someone has diaphragmatic weakness, you can call respiratory therapy. And there's two things that you can look at. You guys know what they are? PIF, yeah. Can you explain that for us a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So the, yeah, they basically do like a bedside. Uh, they basically do like a bedside um, spirometry, and yeah, it's peak inspiratory force. So it's how much basically force can their diaphragm pull in air. Exactly. The other thing they can look at is vital capacity. Um, so this it was kind of interesting. This patient um, ended up actually been being diagnosed with a diaphragmatic cause of their shortness of breath, which I was really lucky that basically outpatient they had already done an echocardiogram. They had ruled this stuff out. Um, they even like, actually already done a CTPA. And I was basically just left with these two things for hypercapnic respiratory failure. Um, the patient wasn't, didn't have any wheezing. You know, there wasn't any signs of COPD. Um, the patient was, you know, breathing, that could breathe out um, like a full uh, breath very, very quickly, which is something that's helpful for COPD. Um, the patient had CT, so I know they didn't have bron bronchiectasis. Um, and I didn't think the patient had OSA either. Uh, so... I was kind of stuck within here, um, but the question was, you know, what to do next, right? So this patient's hypercapnic. Uh, what kind of respiratory therapy would you want to put this patient on? Or do you want to intubate them? Yeah, BiPAP. Yeah, so I mean, just kind of going, just with BiPAP. So like the evidence of BiPAP for hypercapnic respiratory failure for COPD is like some of the best evidence you'll really get. Um, there's a good Cochrane article uh, that, or Cochrane review that showed that um, basically using BiPAP for CO, like pa patients who have COPD led to actually a decrease in 10% of mortality, um, which is huge. So you'd really, if you know, you think they can tolerate BiPAP, you really just don't want to go and intubate these patients right away. And you'll see, I think, as you go through residency, all the risks involved with intubation. You have to sedate these people. They get extremely weak. And a patient with COPD who already has um, just really poor respiratory re reserve, when you intubate them, you know, there's the question, will, will they ever really come off of, um, will they ever really get extubated? So that's why uh, anytime with someone with COPD, BiPAP is a huge lifesaver. But it's also been showed for people with diaphragmatic weakness to be helpful as well. Um, and I'll kind of go into that a little bit later. Yeah, so anytime you really have hypercapnia, you really want to use BiPAP. And honestly, if you have um, undifferentiated um, respiratory, like undifferentiated respiratory failure on the floor, and you're thinking about doing some sort of advanced therapy, I can't really think of any reasons why you would pick CPAP over BiPAP. Um, BiPAP does the same thing and offers you um, respiratory support increases your PaO2 throughout the respiratory cycle. Um, 
at the same time, BiPAP is used for hypercapnic respiratory failure, while CPAP you can really only use for hypoxic respiratory failure. So really, if you're going to reach for one of these and you're not exactly sure if the patient's hypoxic or hypercapnic, um, if they can tolerate and they have no contraindications to non-invasive positive pressure, just go with BiPAP. So this patient was put on BiPAP for a little bit, trended out their ABGs um, until about the next day. They actually had to go to the respiratory floor. And I think by the night after I saw the patient, um, their CO2 had been creeping up. Um, and you know, at that point, they had kind of failed BiPAP, and this patient was intubated. Uh, it was thought that the patient, if I remember, used a head guillain beret um, for some sort of neuromuscular junction disorder that had caused a respiratory failure. It actually had never been fully diagnosed. Um, so they ended up getting IVIG. Um, but I think they were still discharged, into, like, still discharged, um, like trached. And they were an early trait because we kind of knew that this patient probably wasn't going to recover anytime soon. All right, how much time do I got? I'm almost done. All right, let's just do this last case. So I'll read it for you. Um, so 60 year old female, she has past mental history of hypertension and diet controlled diabetes. This is another patient I saw, um, who was found by her friends at, found by her friends at home. So she comes in the hospital, um, she's short of breath, mildly confused. Um, she's oriented, actually she was really confused. She was only oriented to name and place. Um, and this was very, very far from her baseline. Um, her review system was negative other than her being disoriented and complaining of some dyspnea. Um, so her vitals tacky to 110, her respiratory rate is 24, blood pressure is fine. Um, her oxygen is 99% on room air. All right, so let's just go through it again. What are the three tests you want to send for all, any really patient with uh, that is like in the respiratory failure? Yeah, ABG, chest X-ray, and EKG. Yeah, and, and labs, right? You know, you probably want things like, you really want to do troponin, pro BMP, D-dimer. Those can be really helpful. So really all these, um, so does anyone actually want to interpret this? The first thing, you know, the patient's, yeah, say C7.3, patient's acidotic, right? So that's the first thing you always look at is pH. Um, and then you see the CO2 is 28. Um, so, and then the, so why are they, the question is why are they acidotic? Is this a metabolic acidosis or is this a respiratory acidosis? Yeah, so the patient has a metabolic acidosis, right? So that can definitely be one of the things that um, causes, you know, respiratory failure. Um, the patient also ended up having a troponin of about a thousand too. So basically was acidotic with troponin of a thousand. Um, here's the patient's chest x-ray, which is completely negative. And that's pretty much it. Um, so this was a really hard case. Um, I'll just kind of go through it for the sake of time. Uh, so this patient ended up saying that the patient was septic. Um, she ended up having like a lactic acidosis of about 10. Um, and they thought that her, she was short of breath due to, um, due to re basically res compensation from respiratory acidosis. Um, so she was admitted to the hospital, treated with broad spectrum antibiotics, even though her white count and her, um, and she didn't have a fever. Her white count was normal, she didn't have a fever. And then the next day I walk in and uh, the family is there, or actually, sorry, her friends were there. And they told me the next day, oh, the patient's had this like really weird smell in her house for the past, like when we went there. What do you guys think? So they kind of smelled like something was burning. Yeah, so this was something that I think I'm trying, basically what I was trying to teach you here is like you can't fully rely on deliberative reasoning. So this is kind of, I think about two different things. I think of intuitive reasoning and deliberative reasoning. So this is like deliberative reasoning where you know, you just want to go through things and like go through something in a systematic approach. But honestly, if like the friends were there the day before and told her that basically this patient had a furnace down in her basement that was spewing out carbon monoxide, you didn't have carbon monoxide sensors at home. Um, and if they had told you that, you know, had that information earlier, you know, you might have actually had this on patient on the differential. Um, so don't, you know, this is helpful to have this kind of outline, but always take the history and always think about, you know, what's your clinical suspicion of everything. 
Just because this patient had a respiratory acidosis didn't mean that that was the cause of her shortness of breath. And it's really sad. So um, we ended up doing an MRI and the patient basically had like watershed infarcts from carbon monoxide poisoning. And that was kind of the diagnosis. Um, but it was like after that case, I always thought about doing a coox um, for patients who were, you know, hypoxic. Um, when you kind of ruled everything out, and especially if you have a high pretest probability or clinical suspicion. Um, so I always thought this was helpful. So this is kind of like, the, you know, the thing that I use for deliberative reasoning and thinking through someone with shortness of breath. The last case was just like, always take a full history, always talk to the patient, always think about what their risk factors are and what their pretest probability is for everything, or else you'll, you won't catch everything. Uh, and that's it. Any questions? All right, cool. Thanks, guys. Do it up.